and realize that my presentation had actually crashed. I closed my computer in the morning and hadn't saved the stuff, and it was gone. So you have probably seen me sitting outside trying to reconstruct what I had. And what you see here is a pretty good approximation of the previous presentation that I intended to give you. I will talk about imaging of acute stroke, and uh, I will focus on some of the new developments, which you might not be completely familiar with, with which are especially focusing on perfusion imaging with CT. And one of my main collaborators is Brigitte Feldhaus from Utrecht, where I used to work till about two years ago. Now, some basic information about acute stroke. It is, per definition, a focal or global disturbance of uh, cerebral function that is rapidly developing and is lasting more than 24 hours or is leading to death. There is no apparent other cause than a vascular origin. In contrast to that, a transitory or transient ischemic attack is a stroke that lasts less than 24 hours. Usually, it results much faster within minutes or a very few hours. On the other hand, a non-disabling stroke is like a TIA that lasts for more than 24 hours but re resolves completely and leads to no permanent disability. If you look at the incidence and prevalence of stroke in Great Britain, in England, there are about 20,000 uh, transient ischemic attacks per year in Britain and about 110,000 strokes. And half of these people die. So it's a real major health issue. Total of all deaths in England, 10%, more than 10% of those are due to stroke. The most yeah, disturbing thing, however, is not so much that you die, but that quite a few people survive, but are massively uh, morbid and need help from others to be able to do their daily things. They're massively incapacitated. And in Britain at the moment, there are almost one million people living with the sequelae of uh, stroke, and about half of them need help in their everyday duties from other people. If you look at the two big causes of stroke, about two-thirds are due to ischemia, and about one-third is due to hemorrhage. Now, if you look at ischemia, arteriosclerosis is one of the major factors that leads to stroke, be it directly or indirectly. Embolic reasons can also lead to stroke when a clot comes from somewhere and ends up in the brain, but also dissection can lead to stroke. There is hemodynamic stroke, which basically means that blood pressure becomes so low, the vascular territory in the brain is so bad that areas that are between two territories get less blood and that gives you hemodynamic strokes. And then vasculitis, of course, also can lead to stroke. If you look at hemorrhage, then hypertension is the main reason for that. The vast majority of strokes uh, due to hemorrhage are caused by hypertension. But there are a vast number of other causes, and you see that aneurysms, arteriovenous malformations, venous thrombosis, vasculitis, amyloid angiopathy or tumors also might lead to stroke to, uh, to hemorrhage. Now, the imaging modalities that we have are, on the one hand, CT, and in the olden times, we were using only non-contrast CT for stroke imaging. This is actually not very sensitive. I'll show you a few examples. Uh, what is coming up nowadays is CT perfusion imaging and CT angiography for evaluating the vasculature with it. Ultrasound was frequently coupled to CT or to MR to evaluate the carotids, because if you have a patient with stroke who is, again, stable, you would like to operate on his carotid as quickly as possible if you find that the carotid is stenosed. And finally, if you have a stroke, usually echocardiography is performed to make sure that there is no reason for an embolus coming from the heart, for example, a thrombus within the left ventricle. And then you have MR, which basically focuses on the detection and stroke, and not so much on the vascular reasons behind it, like the carotids or the heart. 
uh, you can do it with T1 or T2 weighted, Im or actually not, you have to use all of them, T1, uh, T2 weighted images, flare diffusion weighted images, and uh, MR perfusion or perfusion weighted imaging. And this gives you the chance also to look at T1A images after contrast to see whether, for example, a bleeding is still active. The role of imaging is to differentiate, first of all, ischemia from hemorrhage. There are some clinical signs that will make you look more into the direction of hemorrhage because this gradually evolves and gets worse over time. Ischemia really starts very rapidly and not as gradual than hemorrhage. Uh, it also helps you define the extent of the disease, may identify the potential cause, select the treatment, and help prevent recurrent stroke by, for example, looking at carotid stenosis and uh, making it possible to treat this. Let's have a first quick look at intracerebral hemorrhage, but this will not be the thing that I will be foc focusing on. When we look at the role of imaging, we would like to differentiate whether it is a hypertensive bleeding or a bleeding due to amyloid angiopathy, whether there might be a vascular origin. In other words, do we see an AVM or an aneurysm or signs of vasculitis, or is there even a tumor? All these things we can see from imaging. We would like to define size and location, that's clear. Another thing that's important, if you can see active bleeding, this means that the prognosis is very bad. Active bleeding means expanding hemorrhage, and uh, the prognosis of these patients is much less uh, favorable than patients that do not bleed actively. This is something that we've learned in the past years. There is not yet systematic treatment, but maybe at one point there might be uh, uh, something for interventional radiologists to do there. But at the moment, that's not done. Then, of course, signs of increasing intracranial pressure, which will give you an indication for surgery. And prognosis already mentioned. Now, here's the classic situation where you do see a... Yes. Where you do see a number of uh, hypertensive bleedings, and you can see some of those have broken into the ventricles, others are still interparenchymal, but all of them are sitting in the parenchyma and not in the cortex. If you do see cortical bleeding, then the chance is very high that this is amyloid arteriopathy, angiopathy that does, is the cause of this bleeding. AVMs can be another cause of bleeding. Here you see a T2-weighted image, here a gradient echo, and you see that there is a little bit more black than you would expect. So this thing has been slowly but surely bleeding a little bit uh, into the brain tissue. And uh, so this is something, obviously, that needs to be treated. You also see that it has some massively dilated vessel. The nidus is actually anosomatically dilated. And you can see that MRA is an excellent tool for visualizing that. These small amounts of blood that you can see here are extremely hard to detect on CT and usually are missed. Now let's focus on ischemic stroke because this is the area where there is the most things going on and that is the most dynamic and where we can contribute to op appropriate treatment. What we would like to uh, differentiate here is, of course, the cause, whether it's a territorial, an embolic, or a hemodynamic stroke. That is not always possible, but very frequently. We would like to define the size and, again, the involved arteries. And then an important thing is we would like to see what is the dead tissue and what is the tissue at risk. We would like to estimate the risk for secondary hemorrhage. In other words, if we treat, will the patient actually get a hemorrhage and actually not benefit from our treatment? Decide whether the thrombolysis should be intravenous or intraarterial and then look at carotid stenosis or detect amyloid cardiac causes. If you look at the natural cause of stroke, then uh, you have uh, the necrotic phase in day one to three. Here you have hyperperfusion that leads to a loss of function. But at that time, the cells are not necessarily dead. After a while, if the hyperperfusion continues or there is no blood at all that goes to a cell, then it leads to cell death and ultimately to cytotoxic edema. And about six hours after the stroke, you'll find a loss of bra blood brain barrier with vasogenic edema. And the uh, leukocyte infiltration starts about one day later. Here's an example that shows you a non-contrasted T of an acute stroke. And as you've probably 
all seen here is classic situation. You see this area here in which there is a loss of weight gray, dif gray differentiation uh, that indicates ischemic tissue in this area. In the resorption phase, which is from day four on, uh, the necrotic tissue will be kind of broken off and phagocytosed. And the edema is actually maximum around day three to day five, which is also the, air, the time when patients that have a massive hemispheric stroke, let's say on, of the media, have the biggest chances of getting complications like uh, uh, herniation uh, of the brain. If you do some imaging during this time and you decide to give contrast, you will frequently find these enhancing areas because of the uh, leukocyte in infiltration, which is now so strong, and the loss of the blood brain barrier that you do see contrast enhancement in this region, which at some point will make it difficult to distinguish that from a tumor. So the classic uh, anamnesis plus the, uh, the imaging on the, the non-contrast scan is enough. In the organization phase, you'll ultimately develop glias uh, scars or cystic infarct residuum and the classic situation is that where you see very dense cortex and large areas that contain almost nothing. To decide whether it's something is a territorial infarct, a hemodynamic infarct, or a lacunar infarct, you'd have to look at the shape and the size. And the classic situation is if it follows territories, perfusion territories, it's a territorial infarct. If it uh, sits just in between two different uh, perfusion territories, it's a hemodynamic infarct in which the watershed areas are involved. Watershed areas are these areas that are just between two perfusion territories. So if blood pressure drops massively and you have a bad vascular status, these areas are the first ones that do not get enough blood. Uh, this can also involve the deep areas within uh, the white matter. Lacuna infarcts are small lesions usually in the uh, deep white and gray matter, and they can be either embolic or arteriosclerotic depending on the orange. So sm small vessel disease can cause that, but also small emboli, a shower of small emboli might also cause that. You all know the perfusion territories, but what's important to point out is the by far largest perfusion territory is the media territory. It contains most of the brain tissue. So if the media is involved, which it is in most cases, we get the most damage. Anterior infarcts contain much less problems or make usually much less problems up here. And these territories are luckily variable. Uh, that means that all of us will have different territories. Some of us have more, uh, which is perfused by the media. Others will have, the, have more that is perfused by the anterior circulation or the posterior circulation. And how much that is the case depends also on the circle of villus, whether the circle of villus is completely patent or whether they are hypoplastic or missing segments. That also tells you something about collateral circulation, which gives you a potential for uh, getting less severe symptoms if you have good collateralization and an occlusion of, say, the medial cerebral artery. Classic CT features are the dense vessel sign here and completely occluded uh, media. Then you see the very early features. And if you look closely, you see again here a white gray differentiation and you see that the white gray differentiation in this area is reduced. But you see that it is very subtle, very hard to detect. And if you ask two of us where exactly the borders are, it is very likely that we will tell you something different. So the inter-observer variability in deciding where the ischemic area is is very large in these first stages. What helps, however, if you turn down the window really dramatically to a very, very narrow window setting, that helps you identify these early changes. And then if there's already a manifest, a manifest infarct, you just see this large hypodense area. Now, non-contrast CT or MR, now the answer is very simple. If you have this choice, MR is the way to go. Same patient very shortly afterwards, after this non-contrast CT, which was absolutely normal, an MR was done. And on the diffusion-weighted image, you see 
this abnormality, which indicates an area of stroke. It is important to say that also on the flare and the two weighted images in this patient, nothing was seen, just diffusion weighted imaging was able to, dis to, to show this abnormality. So diffusion weighted imaging is extremely sensitive for picking up these early changes. Now, here we see a couple of flare images and T1, T2 weighted images and down there diffusion weighted images from different patients. Here's a classic territorial infarct on a T2 weighted images, image. Here you do see two uh, infarctions on a flare image in the area of both anterior cerebral arteries. If you see that, then this is not a classic infarct, but a secondary infarct in a patient who had an aneurysm of the anterior cerebral arteries that had been clipped. Actually, it had been clipped successfully. The arteries were still open, and then the patient developed a vasospasm. So the vasospasm caused that infarct, and vasospasm is the biggest yeah, problem in the treatment of subarachno hemorrhage patients. This is a really tragic case of an infarct, again, on a T2-weighted image in the region of the brainstem, pons area, and this patient is locked in. So basically, there's no way that we know what he's thinking or doing. He can't do anything. These are two uh, images from the same patient, and what you do see is small cortical infarcts on a diffusion-weighted image and a few deep white matter infarcts relatively peripheral. Now, if you look at this distribution, what should come into your mind is that this is uh, very likely an embolic source that shoots small emboli uh, into the brain. And finally, something that is almost impossible to see on CT is this uh, infarction in the brainstem, again, in a situation where you see on diffusion ratio imaging an increased signal. Now, if you look at the advance, advance, adv, sorry, advances in treatment of ischemic stroke. Treatment in, of ischemic stroke before 1995 was pretty hopeless. There was almost nothing we could do, and basically you would treat the symptoms afterwards, would give aspirin and cumarin to make sure that it would not become worse as soon as you've ruled out that it's a, a hemorrhagic stroke. In 1995, uh, the NINS trial was uh, was uh, published that showed a benefit of intravenous thrombolysis if the patient was treated within three hours of the beginning of the symptoms. Now, how many patients are that? In most of our institutions, the number of patients will be uh, 3%. And if you do it really, really, really well and have organized not only your institution, but all the physicians in the area and all, this, uh, all uh, the other hospitals and instruct them that if ever there is an indication of stroke, they'll come to you and you are the one that does it, then it may go up to 10%. It is an extremely small uh, group of patients. But still, during this time, you could see some uh, improvement in outcome. And what you do see here is the pooled analysis from three trials from the late 90s. And uh, they included more than 2,700 patients. And uh, what they looked at is the so-called odds ratio. So in other words, the chance for recovery after treatment. One means it's just the same if you do something or do nothing. If you get a patient within one hour, the average uh, odds ratio is 2.25, which means you have a 2.5 or 2.25 times higher chance of recovering than if you do nothing. And this chance is more than one. Yeah, it crosses the line somewhere around six hours. And if you look at the uh, 95 confidence interval, it already crosses that at 4.5 hours. So you see that there is the best effect at three hours. And as you wait longer, it becomes less. Now, why is that so? And the reason for that is because time is brain. So basically, the faster we act, the better it is. But the reason why it goes wrong after six hours is twofold. One is the natural cause of the disease, but the other thing is that the chances of creating intracerebral hemorrhage by our treatment goes up. 
And this is the reason why people are very reluctant to do that after more than one hour. Now, in our institution, if you look at the three-hour time window, we have optimized pretty much everything. It's still less than 10% of the patients. And the problem is this time window is very strict. Uh, of the 25% admitted less than three hours after onset, half of these have contraindications, one of which would be bleeding. Um, and we usually fear the cause of intracranial breathing when using thrombolysis. This is why we don't do it in a few of these patients, or the most of these patients. Now, non-contrast CT is a pretty lousy way of distinguishing whether these patients do have uh, already manifest stroke. It's very good for looking hemorrhagic stroke, but for everything else, it's not so great. Uh, these early changes we'll find in about 15 to 60 percent. You see it's a vast range. If this range is so large, it means that depending on who looks at it, it can be easy or it can be difficult. So in the very best hands, you may go up to 60 percent, but most of us will be somewhere between 15 and 30 percent. These changes can very, be very subtle. You've seen some subtle changes, but this one also has a stroke, and you do see some early changes on it. So you can have a quick look and decide where are the signs of stroke on these non-contrast images. Yeah, left frontal might be. The right side could also be something, but if you look at the basal ganglia, you see that, that you do lose them in this area. But uh, if you would say that something's going on here, I would not say no. It shows you how difficult it is in these early stages. Now, in order to get a little bit more yeah, standardization into this mess, people have came up with the aspect uh, score, which basically uh, scores the territories. And basically, you get one point for every territory. And because the media territory is so huge, you get more points for that. You get actually six points for the media territory. And you can see M1 is here, two, three, four, five, six. Then you have the uh, insular region. Then you have the lentiform nucleus, nucleus caudatus, internal capsule. All of those give you one, uh, one point. And also the posterior region gives, gives you one point. So by doing that, it becomes a little bit easier to uh, compare uh, the outcome of stroke. And you can use that not only using the non-contrast CT, you can then also use that using diffusion-weighted imaging or CT perfusion that I'll show you in a moment. Maximum score is 12 on one side, so basically the higher the score, the worse the outcome. We've seen that. Now, what do we actually want? What we want is to treat more patients, which means extend the time window. And also, we would like to select beforehand those patients who are likely to benefit from our treatment and do not treat these patients that will probably bleed or will not benefit from our treatment. And the crucial factor that we need to know is called penumbra. Oops, it's the tissue that can be saved. Um, you might also know whether there's a vessel occlusion or underlying vascular pathology, because then interventionally we will be able to do something about it and location and size of the infarct. Because the larger the size of the infarct uh, and the more real dead tissue, the less you will probably do. Now, if you look at uh, the perfusion, that's now milligram, a milliliter per 100 grams of tissue. So if that's less than 10 milliliter, that is the infarct core. Penumbra is in the range of 10 to 25, and be, 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 beyond that is oligemia, so basically minor perfusion. Uh, the ischemic penumbra, as I said, is at risk, but this risk is still reversible if there is recanalization of the occluded vessel. Now, quick look at CT perfusion, because I think it's a very clever and good tool for this particular situation. Now, pre-contrast CT we've discussed, it not only detects hemorrhage, but also ma uh, manifest stroke. If it's really hypodense, there's nothing to do. If there's swelling, we will also see that. CTP is the main thing, whoops, is the main thing to detect a penumbra and an infarct. CT angiography is important to detect vessel occlusions in the brain, variants of the circular villus to see how much collateral vessels you have, and detect carotid stenosis. You try to use a thick 
a perfusion slab as possible. And most of us will have multi-detector scanners. With a 16-slide scanner, you can cover about 2 to 2.5 centimeters. With a 64-slide scanner, you can cover about 4 centimeters. The usual position is in the region of the basal ganglia. You will inject a tight bolus, about 40 milliliters, and at least 4 milliliters per second. Depending of your, on your scanner and the program you use, you will have to inject faster. And even uh, if you have, let's say, a program that allows you to inject at these low rates, the faster you inject, the better the results. You do a dynamic scan every one to th three seconds. We've decided on two seconds at the beginning and then less at the end. And we're reconstructing five millimeter thick sections for evaluation. We then, once we've acquired the data, choose an arterial input function. The classic choice is the uh, anterior cerebral artery. The reason for that is it goes perpendicular through these thick slabs which means the least partial volume effects there. And then you take a vein, usually it is somewhere in the sagittal sinus. What you get then is perfusion maps. And they will show you the cerebral blood volume, CVV, blood flow, CBF, mean transit time, MTT, and time to peak, TTP. These two look relatively similar. Um, and they have a little bit the effect of a flare image on MR. They will show you where something's wrong, but they won't tell you what it is. Flow will tell you whether the tissue is hypo or hyperperfused, and the volume tells you how much blood ends up in an area at all. If there's no blood volume, this is infarcted tissue. Now, if you have oligemia or a penumbra, very frequently, the blood flow goes down, which means it's less perfused, but the blood volume goes up. The reason for that is the capillaries goes up, go up as much as possible to kind of keep at least some blood in this area. And only when this uh, mechanism of compensation doesn't work any longer, you'll get a true infarct. Now, from that, you can derive prediction maps in which, in red, areas are indicated that will progress to infarction, and in green areas are indicated that will probably uh, be solved, uh, resolved. So if you look at a practical approach, CT, I think, is I interesting because it is available. Most patients undergo it anyway to exclude hemorrhage. The perfusion adds only a few minutes to the protocol. And if you do everything in streamlined it, you can do it in less than 10 minutes. And it's, of course, cheaper and it allows for better patient monitoring in comparison to MR. Here you see the effect on a 16-slide scanner. It's a relatively small area. 64 allows you more. And on a 320, you can scan the whole scan, the whole brain within one rotation. Now, how do we detect a penumbra and the infarct core? And you can do that with MR as well as with CT. Both of them are equivalent for that. The infarct core is in CT mainly related to the reduction in CVV. We see, of course, an increased MTT, which shows you something's wrong there. But the infarct core is the area where the CVV is dropping. On an R, it's the area where there's increased signal on diffusion weighted imaging. If you look at the penumbra, there it's the area where the MTT is increased. And important that it's penumbra, you have to see that the blood volume is not reduced. And by MR, it's the region with increased MTT. So basically, this is very equivalent. But for the infarct core, we use different techniques. Now, you talk about a so-called mismatch if both of them are not identical. In other words, if the penumbra is larger than the infarct core, at least 20% larger. And if that's the case, you can try to uh, start with a thrombolysis. And the interesting thing is, if there's treatment beyond the three-hour uh, range based on this mismatch, then there's less risk from death, a better arterial recanalization, less infarct expansion over time, and a better functional outcome. However, you'll also see an increased uh, number of intracerebral uh, hemorrhage patients in these patients. Uh, while usually it's very low, it can go up to 2 or even 6%, depending on how well, people look at it. 
Again, the hemorrhage risk increases as the infarct gore gets up. If you look at the criteria for thrombolysis, of course, you have, have to have no hemorrhage, neither intercerebral nor subarachnoid. The infarct core must be less than one-third of the MCA territory, so not a large infarct. There has to be some cortical involvement, because otherwise it don't work too much. And the penumbra has to be at least 20% larger than the infarct core. And that allows you to treat about one-third of all the patients that come to our ER. Here's a situation where you have no mismatch, or almost no mismatch, which basically means the infarct core and the penumbra cover, yeah, penumbra is not much better, uh, bigger than the infarct core, so basically this is a patient that will not benefit from thrombolysis. This, will, this patient will go on to developing a massive infarction of the medial cerebral artery. Here's a, a large versus a small infarct size. This would be a large infarct. This is again something that you would normally not thrombolyze. This is a small infarct. This is something that you could thrombolyze. You see that the penumbra is about 30% larger, so this is something you could try. It's probably not a very good patient that will respond not very well, but he'll probably respond. You also see where the infarcts are loci localized. Here is a, is a, a subcortical infarct. No mismatch, no candidate. Here, mismatch candidate for uh, thrombolysis. And this is the perfect candidate if you only see the penumbra. These patients usually recover very well. And if the penumbra is even very large, then even then you can treat these patients and the outcome is much better than if you wouldn't treat them. Here again, another patient with a large mismatch. So, MR we already saw. DVI, uh, diffusion-weighted imaging, gives you the infarct size. Uh, perfusion gives you the, irreversible, the, the, the reversible ischemia. Again, the MTT is it. And the criteria for CT is that the blood volume is less than 2 milliliter uh, per uh, 100 gram uh, tissue. Oops. And uh, for the MTT is if the MTT on the affected side is less than uh, or is more than 145% of the MTT on the non-affected side, then that is the area where you uh, find the penumbra. So in other words, the MTT, the transit time, is enlarged by 45%. This area is seen as the tissue that is potentially in danger. Now the question is, what should we choose? And there are a couple of advantages. The advantages for MR is we don't need iodinated contrast. We have no radiation, so in young patients it's something to consider. We have a full brain coverage, and it's definitely better for lacuna infarct and for infratentorial pathology. CT has the big advantage that it's always available. You can basically do it in one stop after the non-contrast CT. It is very fast, has better basin surveillance, and is quantitative. So from a logistic point of view, a lot of things point to CT, but if you consider that it's an infratentorial process, CT is no use, you have to go to MR immediately. Here's a, a nice exam or a nice study that showed that the infarct core and the total size when measured with CT and compared to MR is correlating extremely well, high R uh, correlation coefficients and actually an almost identical line, same over here. So basically these two things obviously measure the same thing. Uh, same holds true for the mismatch. So basically, again, both of them give you very similar uh, effects. Here you see the CT, and this is the MR with the mean transit time and the diffusion-weighted imaging. And you can see that the diffusion-weighted imaging looks pretty nice while the mean transit time assessment is difficult, and that has to do with the fact that perfusion imaging on MR is a vast disaster. I thought it was great until I do it, did it myself. So it's really difficult to do. Now, the future, I think, is uh, for, lies in further development of CT. What we're playing around is with our new scanner, which is a 320 slide scanner, uh, to do basically all the evaluation within one contrast bolus. We give 40 milliliters, and we do basically CT perfusion only, no contrast, CT, no non-contrast CT. We start at the brain as soon as the contrast arrives and the peak is just gone. We jump down to the, to the carotid, do a scan at the carotid, and then continue CT perfusion. That gives us 
these images for the perfusion images. We can, uh, we've developed some techniques to extract the vasculature out of these CT images. We can even select arteries and veins separately. We can look at the carotids and it's done within one stop, which basically means two minutes and everything's done and the total contrast dose of 40 milliliters. In the future, you might also want to add cardiac CT and you can do that because you're using now a very small amount of contrast. When doing so, uh, you'll quite frequently find potential causes for stroke. Uh, a group from uh, France has shown a large number of patients that had either thrombi, open foramen, ovale, or uh, massive plaques in the aorta that could de uh, decide where the stroke came from. So uh, you could do it in all stroke patients. Ischemic stroke we discussed, but also in intracerebral hemorrhage, it can be quite helpful because it detects acute bleedings and is immediately able to detect all vascular disease that you might find, AVM, aneurysms, venous thrombosis, and vasculitis. So it's a true one-stop approach to stroke imaging, and I strongly believe that this will be the future. Thank you for your attention.